Welcome, everybody. Welcome, everybody, to 52 Living Ideas. Um, We're continuing our journey into Kindergarten Chats by Louis Sullivan. And um, we're going to have a amazing presenters, as always. We're going to start with Sherry, then Maritza, then Rob, then Choya, and then Rupali. And then we are going to open it up for questions. So let's get started. Sherry. Hi. Um, so we have got a visual um, extravaganza here today. So we're going to share screen. Shrikan, can we share screen? We're good to that? Yep. All right. I'm go to um, Keynote. So um, I'll make sure you start at the beginning, not the end. Oh, uh, don't look, anybody. OK. And you have to hit play, right? Uh, yeah. Okay, so we start here this time. Um, we're now 120 pages into the book and our dear teacher has started finally talking about elements of architecture. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about elements and a few other things from the other chapters. Um, so here in, uh, in this first chapter on peer and lintel, um, he starts with, and I quote, an examination of the simplest physical beginnings, the rudiments, the naked elements as yet without definite organization, as nearly formless as possible. He talks here about a lone lying flat on the ground, a pier is, or a lintel is functionless and useless. When it's, and I, I brought this particular picture of Stonehenge because of course in the foreground, we have a few pieces that are no longer in their functioning form. They are just, um, as he puts it, on the ground and useless. Um, so this particular building, everybody knows this is Stonehenge, but um, in case you didn't know, it's in, it's in Wiltshire, England. It's considered prehistoric for this area, but, um, and this I always found interesting. It's actually a lot later than most people think. Um, people think prehistoric and you're thinking, oh, well, this is before the, uh, the Egyptians temple or the Egyptian pyramids and things like that. This is actually a couple hundred years after the Egyptian pyramids at Giza. And people don't often, it's, it, I don't know, I guess maybe it's in architectural history, it's that, um, maybe impolite thing to say. So I always like to really point it out. So it's prehistoric in, nor in the North, in the England area, but it's not at all at this exact same chronological time, lots of really amazing things far more advanced than Stonehenge is happening closer to the equator, closer to the Middle East. So uh, with that, this one is about 200, or 2400 to 2200 BC, Bronze Age. Um, and Sullivan here talks about what a pier is. I mean, I think you probably all read this so you understand the pier and the lintel are really the, 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 the column, so sometimes called post and beam. Um, it's the column, the vertical element and the horizontal spanning element. And it's really that spanning element that makes it something unique. Uh, before that, uh, the only spanning that humans have is, you know, maybe it's a cave or it's a covering of um, branches or something like that. Um, now, before we talk here too much about pier and lintels, most of the examples we're gonna be talking about are stone. Obviously, before this, Humans had piers and lintels and probably arches made out of mud brick and clay and wood and things like that, but they're impermanent materials. So we don't have as much information about them uh, from that early time period. Um, but what, what Sullivan is talking about here is the moment when this lintel, this latent thing, is laid upon the two piers and connects their activities, presto, by the subtlest of conceivable magic, 
instantly the science of architecture comes into being. He talks here, the lintel is essentially unstable in fact and in time. However, placid in appearance, you know well how and how complex the forces are at work within it. A modern science can teach us in simplest terms, reposing both flat on the earth, pier and lintel cannot be distinguished from one another. Their potentiality is the same. It's only when man's touch, with, when by man's touch, then they are slightly differentiated and they become separable. Um, and inseparable and in, in, in evident function. Um, yet when erected into place by the power of man's mind and body, in response to his mind, his desire, supported all by the kindly earth, a new primitive form appears without and within man. So we have a couple of pictures, a couple of different options of uh, uh, pictures to show you of peers. Um, he talks as we go on here about the essential, it, that it's essential to note the entry of the personal or the human element in these earliest primitive beginnings of art. But one of the things, and this is, um, this is ties back to th everything he's been saying before now, which is to note that with high concentration, how by virtue of the inexhaustible powers of the expressive mind have sprung from the simplest elements, piers and lintels, architects of great beauty, architects of great beauty, yet differing emphatically from each other in a rich and varied display of poetic expression. So he's talking about this he, he's mentions this before when he's referring to trees, their infinite variety. And specifically here, he, he brings up Assyrian, Egyptian, and Greek architecture. Um, so this is one of our earliest uh, piers and lintels. Um, this is the Lion's Gate. Uh, it's the entrance to the citadel in Mycenae in Greece. It's also Bronze Age. 1250 BC, this particular pier, you, this is quite interesting because we have a little bit of each. You have the piers on the side um, and the lintel and this what's called the lion's gate above it. You've got these two lions standing up on, with their front paws on a pedestal with this column stretching between them. And you'll notice, we'll get to this in a second on arches, you'll notice that each of these blocks of stone on the side are edging a little further inward. And this is really one of the earliest arches as well as one of the earliest piers. But what is not really evident in this picture is the size of that lintel. That lintel <coughs> is 15 feet across. This could be meters. I think this is probably meters. Mm -hmm. 15 meters by seven by three. So they called this um, cyclopedic, cyclopean. Cy cyclopean because of the massive size of these stones. Um, the, the, uh, the alleged is that it must have been built by the Cyclops. Yes, by the giants. Giant. <laughs> um, but what's, uh, we'll, we'll come back to see another um, example of part, one of the buildings that's inside of this citadel. Uh, but what's really fascinating to me is the massive, massive structure that comes in uh, with, with this, this gate, with this lintel over the gate. Now, obviously, there would have been originally wooden doors. So this was a protective thing. That's why it was so massive. You can see off on the, uh, the, the stone outcroppings here on the, on the left of the image. Uh, it's really, it's, it's, it's that circle of a medieval town, except for this is far yeah. eight more ancient than that circle of an ancient town of this protective barrier. Um, then we also, he talks about Egyptian. He's talking about these variety of types and shapes and each culture having its own take on the same thing. 
here's another. You can see here the scale because, of course, we got little people in the picture. You can see how massive the entryway here of the pier and the lintel. The whole thing is obviously built out of many, many massive stones. This is the Temple of Edfu, um, and it's in up Upper Egypt. And this was built 273, uh, roughly, BC. Um, and you're getting a different character here. Uh, well, that's a whole different yeah. topic, though. <laughs> um, but with this, he's starting to talk about all the variety each culture will bring to it. Then we talk about arches. And oops, we oh, we're gonna do some more columns before we do arches. Oh, we were gonna, yes, you're right. Oh, yeah, you're right. Sorry. We have the Greek architecture. He's talking about um, again, individual character of individual cultures. And so here I'm bringing in a couple, he mentions Greek temples. I'm bringing a few different examples. And this one is the temple of Hera at Paestum in Italy. It's 450 BC. And this I like to bring up because um, most people don't think quite of, they think of the Parthenon when they think of Greek temples. Uh, but this one has such massive, squatty, beastly, thick, heavy columns that I always like to show this one so people, it's also one of the most well-preserved as you can see. Um, but, and I don't think we have any people in this one, do we? No, so we try to find pictures with people with scale sometimes, and sometimes you just can't. This one, we took it because of the, the background image. But here we have, again, a pier and a lintel. Uh, the lintel is it's a double layer of it. You've got the upper layer and the lower layer right above the columns. There are technical terms for all of this. There's reasons for the shape and the pattern of all of it. Um, that's a whole nother topic. But I wanted to show you just even within one culture, say Greece, you could have a post and lintel or a pier and lintel system that looks like this in Paestum, or you could have this in Athens. Um, and I wanted to get another sunset. This one you can see obviously scaffolding all over the place, they're working on it. Um, <laughs> now you have same column, same technically the same column shape, but it's much more elongated, it's much more airy, much more delicate. Um, much more elegant within the same culture. Still, there is different variety and different shape. Um, I wanted to also show you another version of the Parthenon. I don't know if any of you know this one. And Rob wore a t-shirt in, oh, yeah. in honor, the Centennial Park, um, because I always like to make sure everybody remembers um, when Sullivan is railing about all this historicism, it was really, really happening a lot. So this is a, a replica, a full scale replica of the Parthenon that was built in Nashville, Tennessee for the Centennial Exhibition, <laughs> yet another World's Fair essentially. This was 1897, just a few years before Sullivan wrote this. Um, it's interesting that uh, when it was built, it was not intended like most World's Fair and, and exhibition buildings at the time they did these a lot. They weren't meant to be permanent buildings, uh, but this one was so loved. There were over 100 buildings put up for this exhibition. This is the only one that remains. Uh, it was so loved that they rebuilt it as a permanent building in 1920. Um, if you ever get a chance to go, it's kind of fun. Uh, there's a difference between walking around a ruin and walking around something that's pretty complete. Uh, it's not made of white marble, um, so there's that. It's made out of concrete, which is its own level of cool. <laughs> um, and what's also fascinating is that the sculpture on this was actually, they, they back at that time, they allowed the sculptors to make full casts of the remaining Elgin marbles and then recreate the missing parts by an Italian sculptor at the time. So 
uh, if you ever get a chance to head off to Nashville to get a little bit of Athens, <laughs> go for it. Um, but then we also have um, our next chapter talking about columns, or not columns, about arches. And this, we're back again here at Mycenae, Mycenae. The Lion's Gate that we saw is part of the citadel wall around this city. Um, and this is part of the treasury of Atreus. Um, it was also called the temple of- The tomb. The of tomb of Agamemnon. Um, and again, you'll notice this bracketing above the lintel. Um, again, to, to give you guys some sense of the size of the lintel here, it's over 27 feet across and 17 feet deep and seven feet high. The lintel is. Uh, it weighs a hundred estimated because they haven't taken it out and weighed it. Estimated to be 120 tons. So these are not little structures. <laughs> but Solomon gets talking here about how he says, "Yet I know it happened. I know not how um, that this spanning happens. That this." becoming from a lintel spanning a space to an arch spanning a space. Um, and really architectural history shows us they really happened at the same time um, once we start building in stone. We don't know what happens before that in wood because of course it's, it's, it's all gone. It hasn't been written down. But um, in stone, you're starting to see it already here, where they're bracketing the, the pieces of stone one inside of the other. Um, and inside, what you have is the beginning from an arch, of course, if you take an arch and you spin it in a circle, you get a dome. So this is the earliest uh, stone dome in its full capacity that we have, where it's stepped in and in and in um, and makes this very massive space on the inside. But um, the important part of this though is that I love what Sullivan writes about arches. He says, it's a form so much against fate that fate, as we say, ever most rel relentlessly seeks its destruction. Yet it, doesn't, it, do yet it does rise in power so graciously floating through the air from abutment to abutment, that it seems ever to me a symbol, an epitome of our own ephemeral span. Its plasticity is limitless as that of man himself. And later he writes, in your philosophical, psychological, metaphysical, and somewhat poetical way, wish me to conclude that these two triene simples, these arch as well as the pier and lintel are so similar in their nature that they evidently derive from one single function span which what we're seeing right here um then he really gets on more detail about what this can mean in architecture um and remember he's always talking about the poetic part that it's not just about, I mean, he complains about, uh, about it being buildings that are just about money. And I think in today's terms, he would be talking about the buildings that, are, that don't rise to the level of architecture. They're just developments for maximum profitability. Um, and he also is complaining a lot about the historicism, and he gets into a lot of information on these chapters of why that's empty. Um, but one of the things that he really stresses in these chapters is the importance of that poetic, that, that sense of life, that um, breathing of life into the materials. Uh, and that's what I think is kind of at the crux of what he's after trying to say to, to his student, that to, to do good architecture, you have to go beyond just the practical and you cannot miss the poetic, the sense of life. Um, so as he's talking about 
the variety of all these different forms, he gets into, here it says, uh, we may view and interpret all manifestations of architecture past and present in light of man's temperamental changes. They become for us demonstrations of character, episodes, of man, in, episodes in manner, indices of civilizations and changes of mood within a civilization. How is it, why is it that we of the present in contrast to those of the past seem to have no present of our own except in materialistic sense? Then he goes on to, where did I get my arches? I'm missing a line on my arches. I know, I've definitely been finding it every time. I think it might go forward. I'm sure, either forward. No, it's oh, here it is. In the section. Yeah. Um, the arch of, of all constructive forms uh, is the most emotional. Um, and then he goes into talking about how the Romans held it in bondage as a useful thing. So I thought, okay, let's let's take a, useful, but boy, it, it still has that poetry. Um, this is the, the Roman aqueducts. Then he talks about the Chinese use it graciously as a useful thing. Now, I'm gonna be surprised if anybody knows the date on this. This, um, and I have it here, what do I have it? I didn't pull this date up. This is much, much older than you are expecting it to be. This is the oldest Chinese bridge um, of this kind of an arching structure. Um, 595 AD. Yes. <laughs> so uh, then he's talking about um, the Saracens, the Hindus and the Persians. Um, and so I'm gonna give you a little tour here. We have uh, Islamic, um, the Alhambra in Spain, very delicate. Um, here we have the White Palace in Agra, India. And here, ah, the Pink Mosque in Iran. The date on this one is 1888. So we we're talking about the same time that that Parthenon was built in Nashville. This was built in Iran. And every one of them has its own different culture. Then he goes on to talk about Byzantine, Romanesque and medieval. You see it again, he says again and again, it was needed and understood in all uses. However, they were local, limited and typical. So here's Byzantine. I've shown you this before the Hagia Sophia um, Romanesque, I thought I'd throw in a modern one in this particular case. This was, well, modern in his time. This was 1887. So within a year that the Pink Mosque was built, Tell them where. this one here is in Montreal. It's a train station. This is the Windsor train station in Montreal by Bruce Price. And then to talk a little bit about the flavor he's talking about that comes in each different culture, uh, he mentions Gothic. And I'm sure you're all thinking French Gothic because that's what most of us think. But Gothic in England was much different. This is Gloucester Cathedral in England. And these are fan vaults which are a very much like that treasure of Atreus where each piece kind of brackets in and makes a different shape. In England, um, their vernacular, their normal spanning of buildings before these cathedrals came in place were more horizontal, they were lower, they were usually built out of wood. Um, and there wood, similar wood situations to, to this uh, before the Gothic style comes here. And when the Gothic style comes to England, they intermix it with their own character. And so each place ends up with its own different version of Gothic. So the French Gothic cathedrals of Notre Dame that you're all thinking tall and slender and pointed arches. If you look at 
France's vernacular architecture, even their houses, they have that character. They have the high pitched roofs, they have the pointed windows. So it was part of their culture. So this is another example of um, what Sullivan's talking about. Every one of this infinite variety. Um, here, for example, is Sullivan's. This is his stock exchange building. This is in Chicago, as you can see. That's the, um, uh, the tall white building behind you and behind it here is the Amico. Well, it was used to be called the Amico building. I don't know what it's called. I don't know what it's called now. One of my first architectural jobs was in that building. <laughs> um, and another one of Sullivan's arches, since we're looking at infinite variety, here is his auditorium theater. Now this one is a arch that's much flatter. So yes, there's a whole different thing going on structurally, um, but essentially it's still, it's a span. Um, but let me, let me keep you there for just a second because otherwise it's mean. <laughs> um, so as he's talking about this, he's mentioning um, all these different manifestations and its temporal changes. He keeps going back to the importance of that poetic nature is necessary to keep to keep it in to keep to make good architecture. Um, and he talks about the role of the architect. This is in the chapter on what is an architect when he says, the architect is to initiate such buildings as shall correspond to the real needs of its people. And he says, he must cause a building to grow naturally, logically and poetically. There's that word again, out of its condition. A poet who uses not words, but building materials as his medium of expression. He must impart to the passive material a subjective or spiritual human quality, which shall make them live for other humans. And so I thought it would be really good to show you an example um, of what this means by contrast. So here is what we all see as an everyday boring overpass that has no sense of spirit, no sense of its time, no sense of adventure or no poetry in it. And so what Sullivan, if he had seen one of these, what Sullivan is saying is why have this when you can have this? And I'm gonna throw in a few other possible examples, or maybe there's quite a lot of other examples. This is um, the a bridge in, it's in Switzerland, um, by a concrete uh, designer, uh, architect uh, or engineer named Mayar. Um, I think Rob would be frightened to pass it. Because it is, if you look at, I picked this picture because it's, it's a, it shows you the detail of the bridge, but it is really, really high above this massively deep gorge. Um, so it, it really has a sense of the drama to it. Um, but you could also have this. This is the Crystal Palace. Again, this is another international exhibition space. This was built out of cast iron and glass. Or this, this is older than you think. This is Antonio Gaudi, um, and I believe this one's, I'm not sure if this is in Mexico, this is, this is in Spain. Um, or this, this is Pierre Luigi Nervi. This is an airplane hangar. The poetry is everywhere. And this is, again, I can see Rupali is smiling. This is, um, as well as the one before this, these are both thin shell concrete where it's using absolute maximum uh, material uh, or minimum material for maximum span. So the ratio that happens between the amount of material um, and the thickness of it and the span of it um, is, is, is stretched to its extent. 
um, or this. <laughs> One of my favorite airports, uh, TWA, this is now becoming um, a hotel. So you can stay in the hotel. This is er Eliel Saarinen. Aero Saarinen. Aero Saarinen. Sorry, father, son, I get mixed up. Um, or this one, which is my favorite airport to leave from. Uh, this is in Dulles, outside of DC. This is still a span. You see, but it's happening in reverse. Instead of up, we're going down. But you can see on either end, you've got this column that stretches out sideways, hooks around, and holds this almost drapery of concrete. Or, speaking of poetic, you could have this. Again, these are arches spanning vast spaces. Or this, this is in um, uh, Toronto um, by an architect named Calatrava, an architect Santiago. in Santiago of Calatrava. Uh, and what's absolutely delightful is in, in Toronto, you know, it's winter for a really, really long time. <laughs> this is a wonderful space because it seems to always be full of sunshine. And it feels like you're walking into this tree lines forest with light dappling through. It's a quite a lovely space. Nice. And there we have it. And let's stop share. Wow. Thank you. Thank you, Sherry. You're I welcome. was particularly struck by the, the Gothic. Yes. I'd never seen it so beautiful as, as that. So just, yeah. just amazing, amazing. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, next up is going to be Maritza. So this, um, these uh, few chapters that we read were very architect dense, um, but I'm gonna you know, skip most of that because that is so not my my uh, area of expertise, and it's so covered. I, I really, really enjoyed the slideshow, Sherry. Thank you. So when reading these, what what I got out of it is the call towards a truthfulness of self in one's view of art, either our own or that which surrounds us. And a couple of things that stand out for me is, um, I forget which chapter it is that I wrote this from, but I forgot to write it down. But um, this is, and this is um, synthesized in my own words. Sullivan tells us that everything seen or felt either around, about, or within you has a simple basis. And he goes on and he talks about the, um, the three you know, fundamentals of the um, art of architecture. But before you get there, if you just stop and ponder that, it just speaks to the fact that we do live in a world where we so often overcomplicate things. Like, you know, I, I constantly crack jokes, jokes that my epithet is going to say, here lies Maritza, she sweats the small stuff. And in this here, I hear the call that just a reminder that, you know, and it, it's kind of striking to me. He says, everything seen or felt around, about, or within you has a simple basis. And I don't know, I, that just really, speaks to me um, and, and it ties in a couple um, other things that he says, you know, he says, you were at birth, a living soul. See to it that that soul does not die within you. And I feel like that statement, even though that statement came after the previous one, I think that maybe they should be reversed because by taking a breath and reminding yourself that there are these basic elementals within you. You can find the space to nurture that soul. And he goes further to give us the, or to illuminate for us the tools that we already possess to do so. And, and I really, I don't know, it's, it's striking because it seems like it's such a, it should, it should have been obvious, right? But, but it, it necessarily was perhaps not so much for me. I, I like 
you know, he, he tells us it's essential to note that the entry of the personal or human element is at the earliest primitive beginnings of the art. And that sounds really fancy, but if you remember what he was just saying about the simple basis being within us, what I'm hearing here is that it really is this attention to the fact that all we are, do, say, think, or feel has some element of the artistic in it. And if we can hold on to that kernel of truth, maybe even embrace it as an axiomatic statement, everything else is easier. And because we've discussed in the past that, you know, art is the concretization of those metaphysical values within us. You know, it, it gives us something to look at. What I hear him saying is that this is the way, if you find yourself lost in like the mire of the complicated day to day, art is the key to clawing your way out of that. And that sounds, again, it sounds really lofty perhaps, but it's, you know, he has this chapter on illumination and it's the student feels transformed because he has understood a component that this professor or the, the senior architect has been feeding to him slowly. And he feels so transformed by understanding that, that he uses the term illumination. And he expresses a fear of losing that point. And, and it's that fear, it, it resonated with me because I could see that. I can see that as we learn something new and it changes, there are some things in our life that transform us in a way that sometimes we can't even perceive until we, it's well past us, but we are ever changed by it. And there's that fear when you do realize it, that somehow you're gonna lose it or you're not gonna use that to somehow, you know, the, the improvement that should be had due to this realization or this transformation could somehow be lost. And the student feels that as well. And he asks the senior architect, well, am I gonna lose this? Is it gonna get, if I learn more stuff, is it gonna get buried? And the response is just beauty. And he says, it will remain with you forever. You are born again. For illumination is but that cataclysm of birth. And he says of birth of which I was speaking. And in all these descriptors of the art of architecture, Sullivan is telling us that if we reshape the way we view those things around us, we experience a rebirth. And it can be in several different aspects of our lives. And that's, there's power in that. And he talks about the power of words and how these things, the physical and the spiritual go hand in hand together and possibly no shocker to anyone. My favorite, chapter of these is the one on culture. And I, I love, he goes on and on and talks about why he never specifically used the word culture and why he has never specifically addressed culture. And the answer is just poetry. It's, it's this beautiful, like unveiling where he, he spends like three pages talking about why he hasn't. And then it's like, but actually, wait, that's what I've been talking about all along. And that is so lovely to me. I, I really do enjoy seeing that. I enjoy seeing someone else state something that I, I, I find, I believe, you know, and I'm, I'm still solidifying the manner in which I believe this 
And so to see it in black and white here, the fact that all these weeks and all of you with us together, we've been going on this journey. We're learning about architecture. We're learning about form and function and about, you know, perspectives and restructuring the way in which we see things and, um, you know, how there is value in things that are subjective and objective in the manner in which they have order. And to learn that all of this is your culture, that just feels like an arrival. And, you know, the, one of the very last things he writes in this chapter on culture, he says, true culture means the full opening of the heart, its veritable blooming. Without this, all else is vanity and vexation of spirit. And all I can say is, wow. I mean, that's, I got so excited that I stopped reading. I missed that there was another chapter I was supposed to read here. Um, and I, I just, I'm, I'm not, I feel or I fear that I'm not doing a good enough job of conveying that that was what hit me so much about this section. The, um, you know, Sullivan is saying that the world is seeking people who have an intellectual integrity that spans not only the intellectual. And that is so enticing a thought. The, the idea that it's, it's kind of what we've been exploring, several of us here together. You know, the comprehensivist view is we cannot be one thing because we lose too much of what will make us more alive. And that's just, I think, I think I'm gonna stop there. I, I think that's, you know, Sullivan is saying, you know, everything I've been teaching you is really culture and everything that is culture is what you should be learning. And that's the path towards more meaning and better art. Thanks. Wonderful, thank you, thank you, thank you, Marisa. That's that's amazing. Um, I, I want to say I would want to connect it to his other book, um, System of Architectural Ornament, where he starts by starts with squares, you know, of putting all the kind of the general limits together, and then he shows you progressively as elements of imagination, image, uh, you know of kind of the full emotional expression of the form shows up and he shows it to you step by step. So when you see at that, you know, see the Gothic building that um, Sh Shari showed, you know, it's like efflorescence, you know, it's like flowering of, it's almost like, you know, these are like, this just came into being and it has a certain kind of impact on you. In addition to it being, amazingly functional and useful all those buildings whether you know the building in toronto that sherry was talking about it is supremely functional but it has that on the top of that it has that element that actually speaks to the heart to the spirit all together in a powerful way so wonderful thank you uh, marisa you captured that amazingly well uh next up is rob followed by Joya. Rob. Hi. Um, all right, so the uh, when I started reading this, my main note I had was, well, that's more like it. Because uh, I'm the one who's been sort of a little impatient from especially the first five chapters. Like, wow, well, it kind of gets going slowly and he has to solve this back and forth with the kid. And I want him to get into the meat and the heart of analyzing architecture. And now finally we get to the idea of let's go down to the most basic elements of architecture and talk about the foundations of it uh you know that the pier and the lintel and the arch and 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 uh all that sort of thing so this was very much more like this is what i've been waiting you know now sherry says but he's had to take all this time to prepare his students to hear this i'm like but i was ready at chapter one uh, so I, I was happy very happy about this section um what struck me most though i find really interesting you think of the context of this at the time 
it, there's a section in here and I, I couldn't find, I was looking through it, I couldn't quite find it, but there's, a, I recall a section where he says something to the effect of, you know, every other field uh, of, of, of our modern life, we've had this tremendous innovation and tremendous rethinking and, and changing of it. And, and why don't we, aren't we doing mm. the same thing in architecture? Yeah. And it's very much the context of you had his, he's coming along, you know, roughly 1900 ish, you know, in that, in that time period. And in the previous 100 to 200 years, you have the scientific revolution, the industrial revolution, the 19th century, every other field you had had somebody come through and go in and say, let's take this down to its most basic elements and rethink it completely mm -hmm. from the ground up. Uh, and, uh, you know, in, in, in the physical sciences I and mean, in chemistry, you literally had, let's go down to the basic elements, right? <laughs> in, the literal, in the most literal sense. And you had totally new building forms that you never had yeah. before. Well, but I'm, I'm talking about in, in the sci within the science of chemistry, yeah. you had let's break everything down to the, find the basic elements out of which everything else is built and uh, be able to re-explain everything and rethink everything based on this knowledge of the basic elements. Or a lot of his discussion about going back to the pure and local reminds me of in politics in the 1600s, you had these guys go out and say, well, it would talk about politics. Let's go back to the most elemental thing. You have man in the state of nature forming a state for the first time. And that's what this reminds me of, where he goes to the pure and the lintel and all that is, you know, man in the state of nature building the very first thing for the very first time. You know, he takes a stone and he turns it up and he's got a pier and he's built the, you know, the, our man in the state of nature has built the very first thing. Um, you know, to, to talk about the historical context of this one thing, by the way, I didn't read the whole chapter on what is an architect, but I did catch this little line. He says, learning this, the, the, the student says, learning this metaphysical business is a good deal like learning to control an aeroplane. And I thought <laughs> an airplane? <laughs> you know, the airplane was you know radically new technology at the time that he was writing this. It gives you an idea of he's coming at the end you know, at this. There's been this enormous amount of innovation in the sciences coming ahead of that, and so that's what I found really refreshing about and fascinating about this one is the way in which he's he's basically doing for architecture what's been done for all these other fields of take it down to its simplest, most basic elements, and then build it back up from there. Um, and the other thing in doing that, uh, what I think, you know, the, the chapter of scholarship is fascinating to me because it really gets to this idea of the liberation of the mind, you know, by doing this, by going down to all, all the, uh, the basic elements and building up from there, you are liberating the mind from authority and from bookishness and you're liberating, this is why, this is also coming after his book chapter on man's powers. You're also liber liberating the man's powers, the power of the individual to use his own uh, faculties to think. And, you know, so he has a section, I love this section where he says, uh, on the one on scholarship, would you put a young man's nose in a book, say to him, this is finality. Uh, is it culture to conceal from him his native, I'm leaving a few sections out, is it culture to conceal from him his native powers? Would you show him great works and refrain from telling him that these works are man and that he too is man? Would you dare tell him these great works are unapproachable by us? Would you so belittle us all? Would you so belittle universal human powers you fail to understand for lack of heart and brain? And elsewhere he says, you know, every other, every other style of arch historical style of architecture came out of a, a present in which it, it, it developed this style and, and developed its own unique way of expressing itself, are we to have no present of our own? Um, so I, that I, you know, I think that's the product of this approach of liberating the mind's powers by going back to basic principles. And, and the other thing that, the last thing that struck me about this in, in reading all this is, um, you know, we, we came to this after reading Ayn Rand, writing about the Rantic Manifesto, after talking about the Fountainhead. And the thing I keep saying to Sherry, and she keeps saying, I tried to tell you this, <laughs> is that um, I, I knew that in the Fountainhead, I, you know, Ayn Rand read this as her research for the Fountainhead. I knew she cribbed a lot of stuff about architecture from, you know, Howard Rourke's architectural theories are, are taken, inspired in large part from this. But I didn't realize how much of the, the philosophy uh, in the Fountainhead is taken from this. Mm -hmm. And all this discussion about, you know, uh, 
belittling man's powers that you too are a man and you are you can also think things through on your own how much of that is is really uh um must have had a huge uh, impact and inspiration for ayn rand in, in the philosophical sections of the thought that wonderful thank you thank you rob it's it it was very delightful to see you like uh impatient student where the teacher has been talking to all the dumb students all around you you're just waiting for the good stuff whereas teacher is saying okay don't do this don't do that don't do this say, come on come on let's get to it and finally we got it wonderful thank you thank you Rob. uh next up is joya so People probably know I love to talk about poetry and literature when we're exploring this book. And as Maritza pointed out, these chapters are very architecturally dense, but it was exciting to me to notice the connection between architecture and poetry that really emerges through these chapters. And that was the exploration I want to take us on. And, and also just to, to point out as well exactly where we are in this story. So, so Rob pointed out that this is the moment where, where we're finally getting somewhere. The students finally getting to getting the point and, and really starting to get it and, and what this means for the story and where we're at. So I want to start us in the chapter on culture where we're going to start exploring words. And as he says here right at the top, what strange and wonderful things words are. Uh, because we looked at the elements of architecture. And as I'm going to argue here, we also are going to start to look at the elements of poetry, which are words. And I think Louis Sullivan here has something really profound to say about this element and what words are and ought to be. So I just want to read this section about what he says here about words. He says, so know that words hold only that which is continually imparted to them. They are vital when those who use them vitalize them. They expand with the expansion of a thought. They decline when that virtue or power they stand for declines in a people. Bear this in mind. Words are unreal, the most illusory of symbols, yet they have an objective life and story of their own, both as a race of words and as single words. Wherefore is it that each and every word in our language or in any language is at any given time in its own special condition of health or decline? Yet in each case, the condition of the word is an index of the subjective status of the people who use it, collectively and individually. So when you listen to talk or read in a book, listen with the inner ear and see with the inner eye. Thus will you sometimes be amazed, sometimes disheartened. Sometimes you may be inspired thereby. So too, when you in turn use words, make sure that you possess the wherewithal to charge them lest you be a bow without an arrow, a seedless husk from which no living thing can sprout. See to it above all that when you use the term creative art, your mind, your whole being shall be charged to saturation. And when you speak of the liberation of the creative impulse, be doubly, trebly sure that you are not an empty husk. Of arrowless bows and seedless husks, Lord knows the world is full. But of all the words that are just now ill until death, fallen into decrepitude of neglect, of emaciation, the word culture seems to me the most pitiful. And so from here, now we're even going to get an exploration of what the word culture means. And I think Moritz already even started to do a good job of explaining how in these pages, Louis Sullivan brings together all of these different elements. He, he points out that we haven't talked about perhaps any of these, the word culture, that word before, but we've talked about so many of the individual elements that go on to make up what culture is all about. And I just wanted to draw everyone's attention to this idea of talking about creative art and the liberation of the creative impulse. We are building up to a chapter that is called the creative impulse. And this is one of the key ideas that, that we're really going to explore. So I see this as just the seed here of this really important idea that really it, it's sprouting and it's about to take off here in the chapter on culture. I want to jump ahead to the chapter on what is an architect. And so interestingly here, again, we're, we're exploring a word. We're exploring this word, what is an architect? And, and we have a, a nice connection here right from the beginning with poetry. Because uh, at one point here, the, the, the student is, is trying to, to figure out 
what it, what an architect is and you know, trying to figure out in his own words, doing his own thinking to figure out what is an architect. And, and at one point he says here, what is an architect anyway, Pater? I mean, a real architect. I know what the common breed is. What sort of unusual hocus pocus is he? From what particular heaven, heavenly menagerie is he supposed to have escaped that he is to roam thus, as you intimate, through the wilderness of our land and day? You implied that he comes as a storm. And I think your whole storm business was merely an accidental allegory. Allegory is all right if you were talking to an imaginative people, but stop to think that a poet should arise an, as an exhalation from the spiritual agony and drought of his people to condense and return the waters. And after that, there should be rainbows and other beautiful things is fine, but it's too met metaphysical. It's taken me three months to get it through my head. I thought at the time that you were talking and rhapsodizing about the actual physical storm we saw and felt. How could I know for a certainty that you were at the same time talking about a storm that I did not see and could not feel. So here I think this is interesting. We, we've pointed out that in the story of this book, that the, the story is marked by these sections that go out to nature. And in the very first nature sequence, it was a, a sequence about a summer storm. And what we saw there was in a very literal sense, the student was having an experience of nature and, and what was happening with an actual thunderstorm. And he was rhapsodizing and creating poetry about the physical storm that he was experiencing in nature. But now the student is realizing that this, this idea of the storm is even so much more, that the storm is also an allegory. It's, it's a kind of metaphor for the kind of storm that happens internally. And this is even going to start to help us understand what is an architect and ultimately, I think, what is of a poet. And in this chapter, we are building up to another significant turning point moment that happens when the student finally starts to be now thinking for himself and putting his ideas into words. He's had all of these experiences with the teacher out in nature, looking at all of these different buildings. And now the student is going to take all of these experiences and struggle to put into words this foundational, as Rob put it, elemental question of what is an architect? And we're going to try to figure out what is this? And so we start to see how he's thinking for himself here. He says, I have been thinking this out all by myself. You see, I want to isolate the architect and study him just as biologists isolate a basilisk and study him. Uh, and, and to point here, right, the basilisk causes the fever by acting on the body corporeal. So the architect causes the building by acting on the body social. The simile is not a nice one. In fact, it's rather crude, but it gives you an idea what I'm thinking. But on the other hand, the architect is a product of the body social, a product of our civilization. This you have shown me clearly. My simile breaks down here in a measure, but let it go. I'm through with it. So we approach him from two sides as a product and as an agency. So of course I come at once to his true function, namely the double one, to interpret and to initiate. And so I wanna point out here even how significant it is that as the student is now finally thinking for himself, putting things into his own words, he has to go to a metaphor. He's going to poetry. He's, he's trying to, to compare the, bas the basilisk and, and the architect. And he's realizing even that the metaphor breaks down, but the metaphor is even what gets him to this really important insight about what the architect is. And ultimately, I think we're going to see what the poet is. And I think broadly, you could say this is what the creator is. And these two functions that come together as one, to interpret and to initiate. And to me, this even ties in perfectly with uh, things we were talking about earlier when we were connecting this with even uh, like Marshall McLuhan ideas and, and the idea that man creates the tools and shapes the tools and the tools shape man. And here, I think we have Louis Sullivan's formulation of how this is working out in architecture, in poetry, in, in creation broadly, that, that what the architect is doing is both interpreting and initiating. And we need both of these things. And it's so important. I want to notice here that we had a really important line that comes next where the, the teacher finally says, 
That's very well done. You are beginning to show that you possess a logical and perspicacious mind and that you know how to use it. And the student says, thank you. That's the first sincere compliment you've paid me. And the teacher says, it's the first you have earned. And I imagine Rupali is going to have a lot to say about this because this is just a beautiful teaching moment. So I'm going to leave it to Rupali to talk about uh, what this means for education. But I just wanted to stop here as, as an important point in our story and the story of the development of, of our student. But the interesting thing here is that we can see here that the student is definitely slower than Rob because he did not get it all at once. And he needs to kind of keep coming back and trying again and again to, to put this into words. So we, we've, we've gotten from the word architect to these words, interpret and initiate. And now we've got to think about, okay, what do, what do these words mean in all of their fullness? And, and he's still you know, thinking about this, he says on his own. So he says, uh, you know, I've thought about this a great deal in my own way. I am coming to the crux of the discussion it is this. If it be true, as I have declared, that the true function of the architect is to initiate such buildings as shall correspond to the real needs of the people. How shall I infuse such unmistakable integrity of meaning and purpose into the word initiate, the word correspond, and the phrase real needs of the people, that mutton heads and knaves can't use them for their own shape, shameful purposes by effecting a change of significance in the formula. And here we're going to go on a, an interesting tangent, but one that I think is, is significant and profound, because we're going to start to explore the ways that words can fail us. And we have a whole section here about what, what the teacher is going to call the trickiness of words and how there is a kind of chasm between people and the extent to which words can and cannot span that chasm. So, you know, it's interesting that we've used poetry as a, as a metaphor for architecture, but in this moment, I think we're even starting to see architecture as a metaphor for poetry. And now even that Sherry gave us that beautiful presentation with all of the spanning arches, I find even as I'm going to go back and read this, that I'm reading this in a whole different way as we're thinking about the chasms between people and how, how we span the chasms. So the, the teacher is going to make this important point here about words. He says, you can never make others understand what you mean. It's sheer folly to think of it. That, my boy, is an illusion, a fetish of the learned. You understand what you understand, and another understands what he understands. You can't understand him, and he can't understand you. And that's a beginning and an end of it. There exists between you and every one of your fellow beings a chasm, infinitesimally narrow, yet absolutely uncrossable. The heart cannot cross it, the soul cannot cross it, much less can words cross it. Thus do you, thus does every human being live in the solitude of isolation. Whence comes the word identity? The isolation is unreachable and unescapable. It is for each one of us a dungeon or a boundless universe according to the largeness or littleness of his soul. And around every living thing is there such an infinitesimal yet impassable gulf around every tree, around every animal, every insect, every bird, every plant. Yet within the confines of that circling chasm lies an identity, a soul, unreachable, inscrutable, the ultimate reality, the very presence of the eternal spirit, a spirit of such infinite marvel that it brings forth an infinitude of infinitudes of identities, wonderful, wonderful spirit of the universe, the eternal son. So my boy, do not trouble yourself as to whether or not others understand your words as you do. Seek rather to understand yourself, regardless of words. And in due time, if so it be written in the great book of destiny, Others will perceive in your works more or less of what you more or less adequately have thought, felt, lived, loved, and understood. And to me, this is just so, so beautiful to read when you think about the, 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 the profound truth in this idea that as individuals, we are, we, we come into the world alone, we leave the world alone, we are alone within our own inner worlds, there is a real isolation. But yet there is also this possibility to cross it. And, and when you think about here we are, you know, almost 100 years after Louis Sullivan is reading this, and through his works, 
through the architecture that he left us, through the words that he left us, that we are able to bridge this chasm and make this connection and, and see what it was that he thought and felt and lived and loved and understood and perhaps take lessons that we can apply to ourselves. And so, you know, we're really building up to a, a really climactic pitch here, but we're not even over yet because the student still here has to keep coming back and keep trying to put things back in his own words. And so, you know, he's going to come back. He's, he's going to, you know, talk about, you know, th this gulf that's, that's between us, but he says, but still that shouldn't prevent me from attempting to define myself with a reasonable degree of clearness. So again, let me try to be explicit concerning the words interpret and initiate and the phrase real needs of the people as I understand them. To my own statement that the true function of the architect is to initiate such buildings as shall correspond to the real needs of the people. I now add your statement that he must cause a building to grow naturally, logically, and poetically out of its conditions. Now, all of this means, and practically all that you have said to me means, I take it, in a few words, that the real architect is first, last, and all the time, not a merchant, broker, manufacturer, businessman, or anything of that sort, but a poet who uses not words, but building materials as a medium of expression. Just in the same sense that a great painter uses pigments as his medium of expression, a musician tones, a sculptor, the marble block, a literatus, the written word, and an orator, the spoken word. And like them, to be truly great, really useful, he must impart to the passive materials a subjective or spiritual human quality, which shall make them live for other humans. Otherwise, he fails utterly and is, in a sense, a public nuisance instead of a public benefactor. Isn't that so? And going on, it is not, I take it, the words that make the poem. It is the manner in which the words are marshaled, organized, and vitalized that makes a poem a poem. And just so with building materials, they must be organized and vitalized in order that a real building may exist. Therefore, to vitalize building materials, to animate them collectively with a thought, a state of feeling, to charge them with a subjective significance and value, to make them a visible part of the genuine social fabric, to infuse into them the true life of the people, to impart to them the best that is in the people as the eye of, of the poet, looking below the surface of life, sees the best that is in the people. Such is the real function of the architect. For understood in these terms, the architect is one kind of poet and his work, one form of poetry, using the word, the word architect in its broad, inclusive, actual sense. So here I think we really see how the architect and the poet are one. And ultimately, I think what Louis Sullivan is saying is this is what is possible for all of humanity, whether we're using blocks of stone or words, whatever our medium, that we should be seeking this art of expression, that it is what is our potential as humanity. And I just want to end with the way this chapter ends, where the student says, the architect is now hovering in my maturing imagination not as a superman, but as a real man, a philosophic man of the world, as the creating, guiding, sustaining spirit to the end that the finished building may and shall be an ethical totality, however large, however small. And it's my hope that this inspires all of us whatever we may build, however large, however small, that we infuse it with all of this subjective spiritual significance and be architect poets in whatever medium we choose in our lives. Wow, Joya, that was, that was just amazing. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you. So folks, Joya has been giving you a lot of spoilers about what is about to come. Uh, and because it's all it's all, it's all building up, you know the initial boring time that um, that Rob had, uh, you know, in his classroom was all to kind of clean things up. 
We've been building things up. The student is getting ready. So I'm going to give you a preview of what is to come. We've got three more meetups, okay? And we've got 10 more chapters, okay? The way we are, I'm going to break it up is going to be five, three, two, okay? The first five chapters, we're going to start with on criticism, where he distinguishes between what does it mean to operate as a whole man versus a half man? Full expression, what does full expression of a human being look like? Then his, this next chapter, he's going to be talking about knowledge and understanding. What is that? Then he's going to be talking about citizenship. You know, how does this, how does, how do you integrate with the rest of the society? And what does that look like? So this is kind of the three, three base things that he's going to put down. And then there are two where it kind of, see, he has a poetic flair to his entire creation. So you have to have, just like in music, you know, you have to have the down. So we are going to go down from there. There are two chapters, one called pessimism and second called winter, where you're saying there is such a big difference between what we are talking about and what is actually going on with people. And so, th so there is those, those two chapters that you have to go through. And you have to go through those winters many times in order to come out on the other side. And on the other side, now five chapters are left and we are going to do three and two. The three chapters are really the heart of the whole book, okay? They're on poetry, art of expression, and creative impulse. The book is really about the art of expression. How do you express yourself as a human being? What, what, is, what, what is a proper expression for a human being? That's all the book is about. So those three chapters really is the heart of the book. And the finale, which we'll do in a separate meetup, the last two chapters are on optimism and spring song. So it is, so what? What does this look like when you have this full art of expression going? So that's what is coming up. So next up is Rupali. Rupali, go ahead. Um, so Julia, I thought maybe I should change the sequence of my presentation because I thought maybe I'd start with poetry, uh, but then I thought, okay, I'm going to stick with what I had prepared. <laughs> um, but really, um, when you look at this book and you look at uh, the journey of a student, you wonder why it takes a child or a student so long to get to this point. And although Rob is impatient and you have students in the school who are like Rob, you have to let them go through the process. And in, in Montessori, uh, you will often see that the way education happens, the curriculum is a spiral. It's not a linear curriculum. And if you look at this book, it is like a spiral. You keep coming back to those same uh, points again and again in different ways. Sometimes it's the, the teacher saying something and sometimes it's the student repeating that but saying it in uh, his own words. So the thing about education is that um, it takes time. It takes time to internalize those concepts. And I almost wonder whether Louis Sullivan actually went through this process himself and was therefore able to write it so well, or whether he uh, saw this in the students that he mentored, one being Frank Lloyd Wright and the conversations that they had together uh, whether this evolved, um, you know, that he observed how education happens. Uh, he was also well-read. He, in one of the chapters, he talks about how he uh, is happy that there are people doing more work in education and are breaking away from the past. Clearly, you can see that he is aware of Montessori. In fact, um, for, uh, as a gift to his clients' wives, he would give the Montessori handbook um, to, to, the, to the wives of, because the mothers are the teachers at home. And so uh, he clearly understood that, you know, there are ways that children can be educated. And he says, there is ferment and it is going to get larger. And in due time, it will be really large. And my hope is the same. I think that, you know, I hope more and more uh, people can um, adapt 
to the education system, which is truly um, devoted to the nature of humans. So I'm going to today uh, do three parts for my presentation. The uh, one I'm going to, of course, talk about architecture. And Sherry did a fabulous job on, um, you know, just taking us through the journey of arches, piers, and lintels. I'm just going to focus a little bit on that. Um, but I'm going to lead that into how we start to think about building. And I'm going to share a few examples um, of how children use the same materials and build. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about poetry and with that. So in these chapters, um, Louis Sullivan is taking us um, on this journey of investigation. And he is saying, let's dig even deeper. So it was first at the superficial level, just the outward level, looking at the uh, at the obvious sensory, sensory elements and then going a little bit deeper, looking into the pathology. And now we are really looking at the elements of architecture. Um, and then from there, he says, you know, basically you, an architect has these three elemental items, the pier, lintel, and arch. And then from there, you can have this whole vocabulary of uh, other elements that spring from this. But in any culture, any um, area, geographical area you take, you see that people build, start architecture with uh, with these three elements. And he says, alone lying flat on the ground, it is, its function is, um, it's functionless, useless. And Sherry pointed to the Stonehenge um, picture uh, where she says, uh, where, you know, the stones are lying flat. But then the moment you, um, but the moment this lintel, this latent thing is laid upon two piers and connects their activities. Presto, the, subless, the uh, subtlest of conceivable magic, instantly the science of architecture comes into view. It's, um, it is sudden, instant birth. And so, you know, this whole, um, I, I feel like in uh, classical Indian dance, um, when, there is a lot of footwork in classical Indian dance, but there's also one distinct element um, that the dancer wears bells on their ankles. And when a dancer is just doing the footwork, well, that's well and good, but the moment you tie those bells and you stomp your foot, really the dance comes alive, the music comes alive, uh, and there's a marriage between the, the music and the dance. And I, I felt it was the same way when I read uh, this sentence about when the moment you put the pear and the lintel together, there is birth. Uh, so I'm gonna share my screen. So uh, this is a cave in India. Uh, this is near Bombay. It's called Elephanta Caves. These are from the second century uh, BC. And uh, this, this cave is uh, a temple and it's dedicated to Lord Shiva. He's the uh, one of the trinity in Indian mythology. And here you can see, you know, uh, as Louis Sullivan talks about the element uh, the elements of architecture, he talks about uh, the pier. And he says, the simplest, uh, the simplest is the very, uh, I'm sorry, let me say that. It, okay, the simplest is the very, um, the vertical element, the pier. It rests upon the ground and thus has support, but it already aspires. It rises vertically from the ground support into the air. It is stable for it has both weight and strength. It is serene because within itself are balanced two great forces, the simplest rhythms of nature, to wit the rhythm of growth, of aspiration of which it would rise into air, which impulse we call the rhythm of life and the counter rhythm of decadence, of destruction, of which would crush to the earth of which makes for a return to the elements of the earth, the rhythm of death. 
And so here you can see the uh, very basic column made of stone and it's uh, really just spanning the opening of the cave. Uh, it's not very, um, very uh, sophisticated, but it has a rhythm. It, you can still see how beautifully those uh, columns are carved and um, the proportions of, of the columns. Now here is um, the second element, uh, the third element that uh, Louis Sullivan talks about, and he talks about the arch. Uh, the, this is again, another cave structure in India. Uh, it's the Ajanta Caves. Uh, these are uh, from fifth century BC. And this is a monastery for uh, Buddhist, temple, uh, Buddhist monks. And you can see on the left, you have the columns and the, the pears and the lintel, and on top there is an arch, a horseshoe arch. But that's not a real arch. It is just carved and chiseled into, uh, into the stone. And so this is a very, very primitive uh, form of arch. And um, I'm actually going to read this part um, from his chapter on the arch. Yet how it happened, I know not. Whether the caving in of the troglodyte's home, the stones over the roof became wedged into a certain roughly spanning shape or whatnot. Certain, it seems to me uh, that at some time, in the purple dim of the past, a primitive imagination wondered if stones might not be braced against each other to span over something or the other, a cave or what not. Doubtless, the beginnings were as rude as man himself. But however it happened, and the matters not especially, some man at some time, or successive men in successive times, by a series of rough approximation, conceived and carried out the idea of willfully placing stones, the one against the other to span over something or other. And gradually through the course of time, the process was elaborated and defined. So came into being the arch. And so the thing is that uh, any innovation takes time. And here you can see that, you know, uh, it's not just, um, placing of the stones, but here there's also the artistic expression uh, that the, the early, um, the ancient Indians uh, expressed in this building. Now, uh, on the right is a vault. Um, this is deep into the mountains and um, you can see there are series of arches and uh, Sherry talked about a dome. If you take an arch and uh, move it around in circle, you get a dome. Now, a vault is uh, linear, and if you just lay a series of arches, you get a vault. So here you see that in its form, but again, these are not true uh, arches. These are chiseled in the rock. And you can see that if you look at this uh, cross section, you can see that these, the, the whole mountain is there. And the arches are just chiseled in to give um, that structure some opening and, um, and this entire uh, sanctuary is carved out of stone. It took a long time uh, in India to come to the actual real arch and it was brought to India through the Islamic um, influence and so um, you see the rudimentary forms of arches in India in the caves and in the, uh, the following years, but in the Roman empire um, and uh, even before that you see arches in the Western world, but it in, in India, it took a while uh, to get there. And then after uh, the arch was first established in, um, this Balban's uh, tomb in New Delhi. After that, you see an explosion then of arches in Indian architecture. And I, I didn't um, get any more pictures than this because I wanted to focus on something else. So if you look at the second picture uh, in the classroom, 
in uh, the children actually build the Roman arch. So we have a lot of construction activities in the classroom for students. And this is the this is an arch built with wooden blocks. And you can actually see how first you have, you're just creating the wall by placing the blocks. And then there is scaffolding. And little by little, you put those uh, wedged pieces and then put the, the keystone in, be in between. And then the whole structure stands. The child removes the scaffolding. And then there's this moment of, ah, it just stood. It's not falling. And then there is the discovery of strengths of materials and how, um, how construction works. So just to uh, talk a few things about, um, oh, I, I do want to talk about the troglodytes, OK? Uh, so I don't know if anyone watches uh, Star Trek. But I love Star Trek. My husband and I still watch Star Trek from 1960s. Um, a few things about Star Trek that I like, it's um, such an optimistic view of humans. It, um, it, it shows what's possible, what, you know, there's this adventurous spirit, problem solving, leadership, um, that we can explore and we can um, do this, these things. So, Incidentally, um, last night we were watching uh, the episode called the Strata. Uh, well, let me see. The episode was called. Um, uh, ah, I just had it. Um, I think it was um, the oh the Cloud Minders, and it's about these two civil uh, about the civilization that has developed so well that the elites, the sophisticated people are living in a cloud city, literally a pie in the sky. And then you have the troglodytes living in the caves. And if you look at the meaning of the troglodytes, there are actually cave dwellers and people with less developed um, brains or, or, or a little backward thinking. And um, in that episode, it really captures how the two civilizations are the contrast, and you can see what even Louis Sullivan is saying here, that, um, you know, yes, you have these sophisticated people in colleges and universities, and they're telling you that, let's go back to the architecture of the classics and just take that and mimic, mimic it. Actually, uh, in his um, chat, one of his chapters, there's a footnote, and let me just find it. Uh, where he talks, oh, so it's in the chapter on scholarship. There is a footnote about Appendix C. And if you look at it, um, the, the uh, president of AIA in 1900 gave a speech and he says, um, in the speech, he actually said, He says that uh, it is okay to copy the uh, the older old forms as well as the worn ornaments. It's okay to apply them without reason as veneers to absolutely new construction constructive methods. Even if varied of, uh, opinions assert themselves, it is said that the most of us produce nothing but imitations, more or less feeble and inappropriate of Parisian work of medieval England of Italy in the 15th century or classical Rome itself. Um, and then Louis Sullivan says, well, perhaps the professors of architecture are worse than the architects themselves because he describes them as a bro they're brooding like a blight over their schools. And the thing is that, you know, in, um, I feel not just in architecture, but even in education, you see these old thought uh, still continuing to persist. Uh, and the fact that this was commonly accepted that, you know, we are going to copy uh, from these uh, old, old styles. And really, what, even if you are in America and you have this new country, it doesn't matter. Uh, you, don't, you don't have to think for yourself. 
And so he says, when we ask a modern architect, a modern American architect to solve with Cantor any one of the hundred directly, distinctly modern American problems hitherto unsolved, um, hitherto unsolved, and further ask him in the doing to bring bear upon his solution the highest qualities and powers of a trained and active sympathy, he shrink, shirking and shirking the vital issue builds for us ineffectually after the manner of civilizations long gone, though not forgotten, which had little or nothing to do in common with our own specialist needs. And so soulfully dubs his work as such a style. Such a man is not a scholar. He is a plain public nuisance, obstructive alike of our growth in democracy and spiritual welfare. So, you know, whether it's uh, India or um, whether it is the West, um, you see this again and again, even today that people just copy and, but we're not even following the value system or uh, the morals of those civilizations. So it's very, um, uh, a hodgepodge or mumbo jumbo in, in that case. Um, so the next thing that I want to uh, talk about, give me just one second. Yeah. Is uh, how do we build? How do um, we start thinking about construction. And I'm going to actually just go to uh, the students in our school. We uh, participate in uh, a competition called Destination Imagination. Uh, and one of the elements of this competition is to build. So children get the same materials and they have to create a structure to actually do something uh, with, with the material. These are everyday common uh, materials. And in this particular challenge, the children are required to use a sheet of paper, a, a sheet of newspaper, a sheet of printing paper, a paper bag, um, a paper plate, aluminum foil, a little piece of tape and straws. And they have to build a structure to support five pencils. So I'm going to play this video because the children explain it best how they do it. We all made a structure like a skyscraper. We have a yellow piece of paper inside and it's very strong. Then we made a rectangle size from newspaper. Then we added a paper plate and also we put a paper bag on top. First, the first pencil. One. We have to be very careful when we put it down. Third pencil. Now we're doing the fourth pencil. Only not least, the fifth. Ah! This is our structure. We needed to think how to make this new piece of children to make it far. The children will fold to make this thing to make it stable up. It's been falling down, but we keep on trying to learn how to fix that problem. How we fix that problem is by putting the to make it stabilize. The paper back, it was really stable, but whenever I still put it, the pencils on, it was wonky until I figured out we had to do one, then the other, each way and alternating it. One time when I alternated it two times and put two pencils, when I went too fast and it knocked over. But then once I started again, I went like I went backwards and very carefully. So I wouldn't knock it with my dress or the wind went from back and sides across to the other. First, 
Lee, um, I use this trick to help Finley um, balance his her pencils together. Either make there's a dot in the middle of this paper bag. That dot is called the center of mass. Every every point, the center. If you if you if you have if you if you have this if you have a pencil in the center of mass, it won't fall off. And resulting in centering the balance will help. We use the center of mass as a guide, and then we put. Finally, a pencil in the middle with the center of mass. After, like, we kept on thinking and thinking, we actually got it to, like, work. And so we were able to put all of the five pencils on top. And so while we were thinking, it made our team very good. Um, so in this case, you know, um, the children, so these are children in kindergarten, first, second, and third grade. And they were able to construct this. They were able to create a tower with a newspaper by making it into a triangle. And it took a lot of trial and error for, for them to do this. Uh, I just want to read from uh, the book. Louis Sullivan says, these simple elements, lintel and pear, are yours. Extrinsically and intrinsically, they belong to no time, no people, no, no race. Go breathe into them the breath of your life, that form of the dust under the urge of your need and your will. They become inspired of a living soul. So the thing is that, you know, similarly with children, they will create, uh, I'll show another example. We all need uh, a structure like a skyscraper. Another example is, um, our team from India, these are older students. And one of the things that Maria Montessori talks about is allowing children to think for themselves by giving them many opportunities to, um, to create things from their own imagination. And she has a whole chapter on imagination and culture in her book, The Absorbent Mind. Um, so, I'll play this and you can see the same materials used differently by this team in India, totally different place. But uh, the, the idea is that, you know, using imagination. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. We have made a tower by using a paper bag, a sheet of newspaper, a piece of aluminum foil, a paper plate, a binder clip, adhesive tape, and an adhesive bandage. Avanti and I built the tower together because we were in the same house. Arham had, uh, and we planned on Zoom because he was living in another city. Arham also built along with us, uh, us to, uh, so that we make an equal balance. So we decided to build, and for the first two times, we faced failure. For the third, before starting the third time, we thought, let's plan and let's think, uh, plan and uh, uh, decide what to do first and then next. So this strategy helped us a lot. a lot. And we made many changes, such as adding weight on either side to maintain the center of center of gravity. And the best part, you know, the things we, the things is that we all use our skills, such as. Uh, finding solutions to all problems by ourselves and we use our science, logic and mathematical skills also. The next challenge we had to overcome was to maintain the center of gravity of the tower and we also learned and we overcome uh, uh, come it also. We learned many things uh, such as uh, while rehearsing and we got to learn how the building is constructed. For example, the, uh, the tower was not in uh, equilibrium or it was not balanced. So we had to uh, balance it and also we had to give enough weight towards its bottom so as it remains in equilibrium for the entire session. At last, we resolved it by thinking, discussing it, hearing out each other and trying out multiple solutions. Making this tower was a great, 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 great experience. We got to work in a team, understand and listen to others' opinions. Finally, we balanced the tower and added the pencil. So our tower, uh, which we have made, is 26 inches tall. So now I'm going to add the pencils. So one, two, three, 
you see you know that children have come to their own realization of how it how they were able to solve the challenge as an adult the teacher could have intervened and given them many different ideas but because these ideas are their own they they will forever remember those lessons and i want to quote from this chapter on elimination where the student is now beginning to talk about uh, his own discoveries. And he says, how great is man, how manifold his power, how he creates himself in what he does. I am beginning to see and to feel. Um, so then he goes on to say, I have come to least know that the word subjective contains implies that it is a word immeasurable as man, immeasurable as the universe. I have come to understand what I could not possibly have understood hitherto. I have arrived at last where I may understand the plastic nature of objective. It has taken you all these talks to get into my head the meaning of the two words, which at first I regarded as pedantic, pedantic and technical. Now I see they are human, immensely human. And so in education, we have to give children the opportunity to come to their own conclusions so that they can um, they can kind of see these um, lessons for themselves and internalize them. Now, uh, one of the things um, that Louis Sullivan talks about in, on scholarship, he says, the desire to live in the past and to taste its fruit in solitude is called scholarship but little discrimination has thus far been made by cultivated people between candid and uncandid scholarship, between the scholarship of stealth and the scholarship of courage. Particularly has this held true of architectural scholarship. Once it was innocent, now with us it is vicious. And I feel that it still applies today and it applies to the field of education where we still teach children in the same old fashioned ways because that's what we are used to. And Maria Montessori in her book, um, The Absorbent Mind, she um, talks about, you know, the conscious creator. There's a chapter called From Unconscious Creator to the Conscious Worker. And what's happening in illumination is the, um, the student has finally transformed. The student can finally participate with the teacher in the act of architecture. So Maria Montessori says that before the age of three, the functions are being created. After the age of three, they develop. So the, the very first stage of life from infant to the age of three is very crucial because all of these, um, the natural bridges that are forming in the child, they already exist. But what happens next is the unconscious creator is forgotten and seems to be wiped out from the human memory. And the child who comes to greet us at the age of three is a person we find it impossible to understand. The bonds which link us to him have been cut by nature. That is why there is a there is so much danger of adults destroying what nature is trying to do. And so uh, she goes on uh, to talk about, you know, the imagination and uh, culture of children, uh, actually of humankind. And she talks about how we are, uh, she calls it the web of interdependence, where we are all in this uh, society together. Having, um, and so she talks about schools. If, if in our schools we can break this barrier and tear aside the veils which hide the truth, giving the children real things in real world, we expect to see this joy and delight in using them. Uh, the child's whole personality changes. The first sign of this was the assertion of independence. It was as though the child was going from saying, I want to do this everything myself. Now, please don't help me. So allowing the child to be independent uh, is a very big part. And 
you know, in this uh, whole book of kindergarten chats, um, Louis Sullivan's goal is to get the student to become an independent, meaningful participant um, in society. And the, in this chapter on culture, he, um, so culture is very big for Montessori also, and um, also for Louis Sullivan. And they both talk about um, how it's important for, uh, for, for humans, for children to be participating in, in real things. So, um, he says, see to it above all that when you use the term creative art, your mind, your whole being shall be charged to saturation. And when you speak of the liberation of the creative impulse, be doubly, trebly sure that you are not an empty husk. And uh, he reminds the student that did I not promise you that I would be your gardener? I would plant in the soil of youth seeds of many thoughts. And so by um, bringing again to our um, awareness that you know the student and the child are together in this journey, as throughout the book, we can see that the relationship between the student and the, uh, the teacher is getting stronger and stronger all in this, chapter he almost calls um, Louis the, the teacher father in in, in multiple uh, at multiple times now uh, what Maria Montessori says is that you know uh, is the child's mental horizon limited to what he sees she says no he has a type uh, of mind that goes beyond the concrete he has the great power of imagination and um, in this, um, so up to what point can children imagine? Not knowing the answer, we begin to experiment with children of six, but instead starting with lesser, uh, so in, in a Montessori classroom, you start with very basic things, uh, just building with blocks, learning the extremes, big and small, and very, very basic sensorial objects, and then going into the higher level of language and grammar and mathematics. So she says, by allowing children to go through this journey, you're allow giving them the opportunity um, to dream and to imagine. No amount of higher education can cancel what has been formed in infancy. Hence, we can see the importance of social education at this age. And she talks about integrating children in actual real life within the society that we are in. For her, culture does not exist separately from education. They go hand in hand. It's what we live and breathe every day. During, the, during it, there is still a chance of correcting such deviations of personality that have been produced by obstacles encountered in the first three years because it's nature's time for completing her work. So she says, continue this in the higher education too. Um, just because a child is older, most Montessori schools go up to um, kindergarten level, and uh, there are now more and more schools opening that go further up to high school level. And uh, she says this would lead to a greater harmony of life upon earth. In other words, civilization can produce changes in man himself, just as it has produced changes in the surroundings offered by offered him by nature. Magic powers are thus conferred upon. Um, the human race. And with that, I'm going to um, go on to, you know, what are the powers of uh, humans? We've talked about it before. And he says uh, in the chapter on culture, what would that, what that, uh, I'm sorry, would that be culture? Or would you say to him, as I say now to you, my son, the world is seeking new, more than ever, men of force, of intellect, and strength of character, men of culture. It needs them, for it has much for them to do. Supremely, does your own country need such men in all walks of life? It sadly needs them. It sadly needs confidence in them to make it for their buildings. Such men it needs in every walk, in every function, in every activity, in order conclusively to express the realities of destiny the realities of racial wisdom and character, the realities of land and time, the genius of the people, 
once it believes in them, it will welcome them. And so um, he he's urging uh, the student to think and create for himself. Um, let me just go back to uh, one of the earlier pages where he says, you know, the student starts talking about understanding words. And he says, I now begin to understand what you have said about words with their contained power, how they may be surcharged by us with new powers, new meanings, how they may be created. And um, the teacher says, well, I have been looking for this in your case. And the student is now showing the teacher multiple times that he is getting there. I'm going to- Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Sorry about that. Um, I'm going to go on to the next video. So every year we do a poetry recital at our school. And uh, the children are encouraged to read classical poems from all over the world. Um, so we do poems from China, from uh, India. We do poems from Europe, poems from America, and uh, poems from different time periods in uh, history. Right from kindergarten to grade eight, all children memorize poems. So in kindergarten, it could be as simple as nursery rhymes um, to getting into Edgar Allan Poe and uh, so on and so forth. At some point, children decide to write their own poems because they've been immersed in poetry and there's something in them that is urging them to say, I want to do it for myself. And here is one poem. Um, this is uh, Noah Sear, he is uh, our uh, oldest student at the school currently, and he is uh, passionate about dance. He is a dancer, and this is the poem he wrote for his um, poetry recital. Now, it captures everything that uh, Louis Sullivan is talking about, that, you know, uh, he says words, words are existing, but they're meaningless unless we put meaning in them. Similarly, he's talking about the architect. The materials are latent, they're existing. And what is it that you are bringing from your imagination? So I'll play this. All My Heart by Noah Sear. Here we go again with the stress of the world. If you could see my stress, it would be curled up into a little ball, oh so high, but with the I can tie. When I can't speak because of all the shame, and people start to whisper about my pain. When I feel like there's nothing left to gain, dance reminds me that life is all a game. Dance brings me down from all my work. It calms the flood, it stops the flurries. And I'm so happy that dance is around, or else I wouldn't be Broadway bound. But sometimes it's the opposite way around, just like sometimes they go to the opposite side of town. Sometimes dance is the thing that gives me stress. Because sometimes I can't be the best. Sometimes there's just a boy who has better feet. A girl who did just a Joffrey Ballet seven this week. Like, how am I even going to compare? Yeah, this is totally fair. Well, there is one thing that I have that matters. It's passion, personality, and presence in a bag. I command signs. All eyes at me. And I impress them with my beautiful technique. I always used to be this way. I wasn't able to do the splits, aggro chips, or leap for days. But I've always had this thing going on, and I will use it until I'm long gone. Expressing yourself is something new, if it's something super hard to do. Come on, let's face our fears and carry through. Come on, I will dance with you. Um. Let me just uh, stop that. Okay. So um, that, you know, in that poem, he captures his passion. He also captures his fears. And you can see that he is also just coming into his own self. He's learning that it's okay to be fearful. It's okay to, um, not be able to do everything, but you're going to try, you're going to give it a shot. And you can, especially at that age, we see the fruition of this journey that the student is taking that 
Louis Sullivan talks about in this book. I mean, for me as an educator, I feel he's captured that student's journey so well because you see the struggles, you see on some days children and uh, adults too have this aha moments and then other days it doesn't work. And so you need to constantly fuel that, um, that imagination with you know, new sparks and new uh, energy. I just want to end with this part. He says, in such regard, my work has been, so the teacher is saying, in such regard, my work has been, is and shall continue to, to the end, a work of love, born of reverence for youth and of fidelity to the country of mankind. But I repeat and should repeat over and over again, all the rest you must do. I cannot do your thinking, your living, or your growing for you. I cannot define your personality. I will not delimit it. The true work of the architect is to organize, integrate, and glorify utility. Then and then only is he truly a master worker. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rupali. Uh, I really like this entire kind of parallel between Montessori and uh, Sully, Sullivan, that's that's working very well. So, folks, it's time for Q and A. Uh, go ahead and type exclamation mark. Uh, let's do only questions at this point. Uh, we're running a little late, but feel free to ask any any questions. Um, and maybe short comments are okay too. But uh, let's keep it uh, so that we can go to as many uh, questions as possible. Uh, keep on topic. Be brief. Speak your mind courteously. First up is Ash. Ash, where, uh, give me just a second. I want to make sure that this is working. Okay. Ash, where, where are you? And what's your question? Uh, Ash, you need to unmute yourself. There we go. Hello from Curacao. Um, so I loved what uh, Rupali was just talking about, about uh, integrating the students with real life uh, and society society and the need for them to learn firsthand through, through experience. Um, and I guess my question is, how does that apply uh, beyond school? Because, you know, we've talked a little bit about kind of continuous lifelong education and, you know, even, you know, with the student teacher set up in the dialogue, you know, the, those are kind of relative terms. The, the student is a student relative to the teacher, but the teacher is still a student of life as well. Like we should never those principles that Rupali talked about still apply throughout life. So I'd like to hear a little bit more about, about that. And I think uh, Joya probably has a lot to say about that as well, but anybody who wants to jump in would be great. Well, I can start, um, you know, I, you're right. I mean, these are life lessons that he talks about in the chapter. It's not just uh, a student talking to, uh, that the teacher teaching the student, it's really life lessons for everyone. And I think, um, how do you continue? One is continue doing you know, things like what we're doing here, the meetup, by reading new books, by discussing new ideas, um, creating things that you uh, enjoy. Find projects to do. I know that um, you know, there, are, there are many maker spaces uh, around the country and it's easy to go to a maker space. All the tools are available and you can create projects, um, you can be engaged. Uh, gardening, gardening is a great um, activity and you can learn a lot in the garden. It, clearly, Louis Sullivan and Maria Montessori both uh, express that in their books. So those are um, some thoughts that I have. Anybody else wants to jump in? Okay. Oh, thank you, Rupali. All right. Uh, next up is going to be Joe followed by Jyoti. Joe. Yeah, just really quickly, when you're coming up with these projects for these for the kids, like what is it that you're trying to accomplish like initially, like it, even the thought process when you're creating them with like five pencils or something along those lines? What is it the the true objective is like I understand that it is their creativity that you're trying to harness but when they walk away from that then what is it else that they're taking away 
So um, I started these projects when my son was in third grade and I found that, you know, he was doing his reading, writing, math things at school, but he really wasn't thinking uh, about problem solving. And our everyday life is about problem solving. And how do you um, take a skill and apply it? Uh, you know, I wanted to make sure that my son grows up to be an independent human being that uh, he enjoys the work of hand that he can create for himself, what he, whatever the life he wants. And to be able to give him early on the opportunities to see for himself. You know, uh, for me, I think uh, because I come from a family of traders and merchants, we were selling strawberries, we were growing strawberries, we were, um, you know, working at the factory with my father, working in the cloth shop with my uncle. Those were real life skills that we were exposed to. But uh, in America, my son was kind of uh, uh, excluded from those opportunities. So by bringing them to the school and by bringing them to the children, we can actually have a microcosm of real life of saying, okay, how do you communicate with each other? How do you take leader, uh, leadership um, opportunities? How do you follow? When do you follow? How do you communicate? I mean, Shrikant lays out these rules every time. Communicate, uh, you may disagree, but courteously. And so how do you start doing that as a child and teach them those skills at a very young age? Um, so by the time they're in middle school, they're extremely articulate. They are able to problem solve. They are able to um, think outside the box. And one of the things that our fitness instructor says, you know, expect the unexpected. By doing this and making it a habit, children learn to expect the unexpected. And when things come at them um, in life, they know how to deal with them. They build resilience with these projects. So those are some of the more um, broader goals of these projects. Does that answer your question? Here? Absolutely. I mean, that's exactly what, it, you know, and that's what school should be about is just to figure out and come up with a solution to a problem, not necessarily follow a formula or a tick a box or, you know, checklist where you're just going to figure out because then that inevitably fails. And when that fails, the student does not react. That's why I really appreciate the freedom that was given to the students to come up with a solution. And that's why I was wondering even how you came up with the problem itself of putting five pencils. And then they, they all applied logic differently. And they, they, it, was, it was really wonderful to see. So thank you. Um, and uh, you know, in uh, the book, Louis Sullivan says, my boy, formulas are a dangerous thing. While the spirit of that art escapes and vanishes forever, the bright spirit of art must be free. It cannot live in cages of words. Its willing home is in the boundless nature, in the heart of people, in the heart of the poet, and in the work of the poet. So the thing is, there's no formula. You have to use your mind. That's the only formula. Um, I know Sherry wants to add something. <laughs> yeah, I, I actually um, have a little uh, video to share that there's another level uh, on top of everything that Rapali is talking about that happens with these projects. Um, you want to share screen? I'll explain. Yeah, I'll share screen. So our school has a project like this too. This is our youngest. Um, their job was to create a table out of nothing but rolls of printer paper and tape. And so they spent a bunch of time figuring out how to do this. And at, at the end, it was how much weight can your table hold? And um, Oscar's table here is, uh, looks like a bridge structure. <laughs> He's learned a lot about structure um, just living around with us. But part of the um, purpose of this too is to have this kind of a reaction from the kids because he had no idea how much weight his table would hold. And so I'll let you watch the video. Now, I had another idea. This might be dangerous. <laughs> Just throw these books. All 
arms wiggling. <laughs> Are your feet up? Oh. Ba -ba Make sure the books are square over the middle. Oh, oh geez. This is nuts. <laughs> oh, geez. Oh. <laughs> Should we stop there? No. I'm just gonna. Uh, I never knew this was gonna happen. That's over a hundred pounds. This is over a hundred pounds. <laughs> um, and then what probably happened, which you can't see in this video, but t literally a second and a half after I hit the stop button, the whole thing collapsed. <laughs> <laughs> so that's also the point of those is to have that kind of wonder and a uh, sense of accomplishment that the kids come up with when they create something they have no idea it could hold that much weight. Wonderful. Next up is Jyoti followed by Maritza. Jyoti. Yeah, hi. A great presentation as usual. Uh, my question is, um, well, first I'm gonna make a statement. <laughs> The reason I have appreciation for nature and what Frank Sullivan uh, is talking about is because I have an old soul. I grew up in the countryside. Um, you know, we, ours was the only house, um, second house maybe in a, in a countryside before it became mobbed with crowds. And I learned a lot of things on my own, like Rupali school. I didn't go to a Montessori school, but I went to a nice school where they were teaching very nifty stuff. And I think when I my children went to school here in America, I went to school with them <laughs> because they were bringing their projects home. I was learning from them and I said, wow, this is neat, this is neat. What happens to these children as they get older? They seem to lose something in them that was so vibrant and so um, resilient that when they get older, they start uh, becoming very um, curriculum um, you know, um, uh, related things. Like they will do science projects and that is fine, but then nothing comes in the adulthood. So all those things that they were doing, nothing happens to them when they get older. You know, when I take my uh, dog for a walk in the city, I see these beautiful homes in Philadelphia where the older people are doing gardening and they're decking it up. You go to the concert, you see older people. You see you know, all the retired people doing very beautiful, mind soothing things. But younger people, they're not into it. How do you ignite their desires, their you know, meaning for life, for the nature? I mean, something does happen to them as they get up in the years. They are not the same children who are given opportunities to build and create and have appreciation for color and art and what have you. Any answers? A wonderful <laughs> question. Go ahead, Rupali. So I, I have been following up uh, with my students. So now the students that I taught about 18 years ago are now adults, functioning adults. Many of them are in um, STEM fields um, and all of them have a passion of some form or the other. Somebody is in fencing, somebody is doing, um, they, they run their own little farm shop or things like that. Um, they are independent people. They, they are productive. They are, you know, they, they are also young, so they also have to do things that the young people do is like forming relationships, creating their families, setting up their lives. I mean, that also takes a lot of time to, to, uh, to start a family and to be dedicated to that. They're good parents. Um, some of them now have two kids and they're, they're completely involved with their family and their children. Um, but they, all of them have a great sense of life. They are all joyful people. They are all looking for doing 
things creatively. Um, they, they do find pro solutions to problems in their lives in creative ways. They don't complain. They roll up their sleeves and get to work and fix whatever they need to. I have a student who's now a motorcycle driver and he rides, um, you know, he's, he's exploring. He is a young man of 26 and he's exploring. I have a student who went to China and uh, became a teacher. He did his master's in economics and then went to China and taught English as a second language to kindergarten students. So um, some of them are into theater and acting and they have multiple fields that they follow. So I see um, that these children are, you know, just good citizens and they will do great things, I'm sure. But we also have examples of uh, graduates of Montessori, like the Google founders, um, Jeff Bezos, you know, uh, Julia Childs. These are all Montessori students and Frank who all went to do great things. Those are my two sets. Uh, so I, I'll, I'll just say one thing. Um, see, children by their nature are curious when they start out. And, but that itself is not enough because they are kind of reactive at that stage in the early stage that they're just enthralled. What they need to pick up is the independent ability of learning and pursuing goals. And that's what Montessori gives them. So two children who have the same amount of enthusiasm, one who goes to Montessori, who gets kind of, learns to kind of be this self-driven person. That's a, that's a big achievement from, for the kid. And it requires a lot from the teachers, from the parents to get them there. If a person, if a kid does not reach that, then without that internal drive and internal ability, the external thing stops becoming as enthralling as they grow up. So they become more kind of reactive. So the job of the education of the Montessori school, of the teachers, of the parents is to build that. And so the difference is, have you, do they have it or they don't have it? And I think that's, that's the difference. And Montessori is particularly good because that's all it is focused on. Um, I just want to say something really quickly there. I am not the product of um, having enjoyed Montessori school. Um, I, I, and the product of Catholic school upbringing. So it's almost the absolute opposite here in um, uh, the Americas. A Catholic school is very regimented. It's very, very old, traditional. I mean, you know, I used to actually get my knuckles wrapped because I'm left-handed and they were trying to discourage that. So it's that kind of very blind, you will be fitting in this box. That's the background I come from. And um, so Jyoti, I would say to you that as an adult, somebody who was not fostered in this beautiful, beautiful environment that Rupali is describing for us, the impetus lies within us. And I really think that it's just a matter of remembering to be curious. Like it's a, it's a matter of, it's that, you know, cliche where they say stop in some other roses, you know, but if, you know, in, in a meetup last week, I brought up the term systemic wonder. And I think that we can, as adults, we can find the same wonder and continued learning as Rupali is describing for us. If we, if we stop and just maintain that internal wonder in just various aspects of life. And um, that's just kind of how I see it. Like I, I try to be immersed in that in which I'm doing, even if it's something small, because it just reminds you to be there and it'll just explode a whole bunch of different things that you're gonna to wanna to follow because you're curious about them. And that's how we grow and learn. Wonderful. Uh, next up, uh, sorry, um, go ahead. Sure. I was just gonna say, um, Jody has mentioned here, what about the non-Montessori children? Um, and Maritza gave a perfect example of this. I did not go to a, Mon Rob didn't go to a Montessori school environment either. 
um, Maria Montessori didn't go to a, Marie, to a Montessori school, yet she came up with this. Um, and I really think that one of the benefits is it's part of our nature um, to find joy. And that is always there as it, you know, it's, it's, it's like um, as babies, we uh, yearn for the sweetness of milk um, in the uh, rest of our adult life, that sweetness of joy is, it draws you um, and, and it, it tends to help no matter what situation somebody's grown up in, sometimes in a really regimented or even a really awful, a horrible environment, <clears throat> you still have people who come out of that who are searching for that joy and, and realize how healthful that joy is in your life. So that's always there, no matter what kind of environment people are brought up under. So it's a great, great point. I mean, the, the, the impetus is inside. The question is whether it's going to be, you know, what Montessori does is it provides a good soil for it. So it becomes easier to kind of build up, but, you know, I've seen many, many, many people who have done that, you know, you look at their background and you really marvel at what, how they approached it, because it's a question of what, what do you do with it? So it's fantastic. Um, can, can I just add a Louis Sullivan also did not have the benefit of a Montessori education. And after this book, we're going to read the autobiography of an idea. And that is the whole exploration. So much of that book is about his childhood and into adulthood. And we see how it was that that he had that that wondrous childhood spirit and how he maintained that in his life. I think it's a beautiful example of how one goes about and does this that we can all learn from. Excellent. Maritza, I'm glad you got your copy. I'm All ready. Right. You have a question. Go ahead. I do. Um, this is a little bit, this is separate from what we were just discussing. Um, so in the chapter on scholarship, he, uh, Sullivan very briefly talks about um, how we have to carefully discriminate between semi-honesty and semi-dishonesty, between seriousness and frivolity, between strength and weakness, between boldness cowardice and evasion of purpose. And I, I really was very struck by this concept of the evasion of purpose, again, because it's very Randian sounding. That sounds like it just came straight up from Ayn Rand. But from, for me, I have struggled as I interact with the world with the, the concept of honesty. You know, it, it can be a subjective term and so I'm looking at these things where he says we have to carefully discriminate. And I'm curious as to some of you, um, some of the other panelists take on, how do we take that? Do we take it in a literal sense or do we look at it more as a tangential thing? Like, you know, I feel, I read it and I'm like, yes, he's telling you people to be more honest and to lie less. That probably is a little too literal. So I'm just curious to hear some of your thoughts on that what he's saying in that arena. Um, I think he's talking uh, at this point about, because um, this is a chapter on scholarship. I think he's talking about architects in, in taking the historic approach. And he talks here just, a, I think a couple paragraphs beyond what you're saying. Um, the desire to take refuge in the past has both an honest and dishonest aspect. Um, and he talks about the scholarship of stealth and the scholarship of courage. And particularly this has held truth of this architectural scholarship. Once it was innocent, now it is vicious. Do you hear in that an, an admonition for ensuring that something we're holding on to is not actually a lie we're telling ourselves? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, then I think a lie you're telling yourself is, is the important thing because it's not about lying to other people. It's about lying to yourself. And I think specifically we discussed with the evasion of purpose. I think it's about lying that one of the, I think one of the issues he has in mind, and I know it's a, it's a major issue is the idea of lying to yourself about who you are, yeah. about what kind of person you are. So you're saying, Oh, I'm out. You tell yourself I'm out trying to deal with this problem, but you're actually not focused on that. You're focused on something else. 
you're focused on how you feel about something or on trying to maintain an, an external image of being a good person or, or being, you know, the external image you, you are presenting to others rather than focusing on the actual purpose that you tell yourself you're concerned about. And one of the things, just the very next page, he says, to be true must bear, um, briefly, it's evident that results of scholarship to be true must bear a relation of unmistakable value to the day and generation of the scholar. Otherwise, he has no function, no excuse for being. He becomes a parasite. I love that you've read everything I've highlighted in this last few years, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> it's just Can whether I it's underlined or whether it's green highlighter. It all depends on which <laughs> time I read it. I wanna, did you even, like, I think there's something even to be said in the, the paragraph that comes right next where he talks about, um, so he says here, every and any field of inquiry is a legitimate province of activity for a certain mind of a certain caste, provided the results of such inquiry are couched in terms distinctly germane and reached with entire mental candor. But when such inquiry is made under dubious pretenses and its results couched in terms that are irrelevant or misleading, such a procedure can be classed only as egoistic and reactionary, in short, as mental dishonesty. So I, I think even just, you know, these ideas of, you know, the, the mindset on the one hand that is germane and faced with candor versus one that starts with dubious pretenses and is irrelevant, reactionary, misleading. I wonder where fear would fall in on that spectrum, because fear would be a, a form of mental dishonesty to ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. Or acting, acting on fear would be the mental dishonesty. Or not acting due to fear. Yeah. Yeah. But then I love that at the very, towards the very end of this chapter, or I guess it is like just a couple paragraphs before the very end, he makes sure that we don't misunderstand him. And he says, of true scholarship, we can never have too much. It never burdens or wearies, nor does it dull the mind and dry the heart. Rather, it Rather, does it give wings to the spirit, serenity to the mind and to the heart, eternal youth? Thank you. Um, Jyoti, you had a question? Okay, she's going to skip. All right, uh, so folks, um, next time we're going to be doing on criticism to winter, so five chapters. And then we're going to get ready into the, the remaining five. Uh, it's okay to read ahead and finish the whole thing. You won't ruin it for yourself or others. Uh, so, uh, and it actually bears, it becomes better when you read more multiple times. Yeah. All right, folks, um, uh, we've got some very interesting meetups. Uh, tomorrow, I'm gonna to do a meetup on a book called Art of Learning by Josh Waitzkin. He was a chess prodigy who won eight championships and uh, before the age of 16. And then there was a movie made about him called Searching for Bobby Fisher. And that, you know, he became famous and he put it, the way he puts it is that he got separated from his love of chess when he became famous because it no longer was a personal quest for him. It was, you know, he worried too much about what other people would see that he had to win, things like that. So he gave up chess and then went into doing Tai Chi push hands and became the world champion, though he started at in his 20s. So which is quite remarkable, actually. Uh, most, most of the people start very, very early for that. And what he does is that he talks about the principles of learning. How do you learn? and using these two very different disciplines of chess and martial arts. Uh, it's, uh, it's fantastic. So it, we are gonna do this at, uh, on Sunday tomorrow at 2.30. Uh, there is a great video of Josh, about 10 minutes to introduce it. And then there is a very detailed, which is very unusual. It's a very detailed uh, book notes of each chapters and what principles did he le learn from each chapter. It's a very short read. 15 to 20 minutes. So um, looking forward to seeing you there. I'm going to try some very interesting format of improv. Uh, so I'm going to have myself and Mike going back and forth. Uh, Mike has been teaching chess and I think some martial arts too for the past 20 years or so. So we're going to be uh, kind of 
seeing how, how we can go through the book uh, in an interesting way. So don't miss that. I uh, look forward to seeing you. Bye. Bye. Bye, everybody.